Good evening and welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number 11 on the moon as a harsh mistress by Robert Heinlein. This is indeed the penultimate session on the moon as a harsh mistress. We will be finishing up next week, September 8th. Um, uh, I'm, wow, I'm on the subject. Uh, let me talk about the schedule to come. I have decided... Um, you guys know that my original plan uh, was, you, you, you will remember, that we're going to do um, The Nature of Middle-Earth, uh, edited by Carl Hostetter next, which is just being released right now. Um, very exciting. Uh, I can't wait to read that book. Um, I haven't yet still. But... Um, so I, I wanted to start it, like, as soon as possible after the book came out originally. Um when we did pretty well. I was hoping to finish The Moon is a Harsh Mistress today, and we're going to finish it next week, so only one week after my original projected stop date, which is a pretty good, pretty good for uh, uh, for what we've, uh, for <laughs> compared to my recent track record. Um, so anyway, so that's, um, uh, that's definitely um, uh, where... Uh, so that was the, the original plan was to start actually next week on September 8th. Obviously, that's not going to happen. So I think I'm going to actually delay a little bit. There are a couple other reasons why I'd kind of like to delay. But of course, one reason is that it's hard to resist the temptation to start discussing the nature of Middle Earth on Bilbo's birthday, um, the 22nd, which is... Uh, right in line there on on a Wednesday. So I think that's what, what we're going to do. Um, we will wait. Uh, this will give everybody a chance to get the book and start reading it and thinking about it. And then we can uh, we can start talking about it on Wednesday, the 22nd uh, of uh, uh, of September. So that means we'll 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 finish Moon is a Harsh Mistress next week. We'll take the 15th off and then we will come back together on the 22nd to begin discussing the nature of Middle Earth. Um, I'm pretty excited about that. So uh, I hope you guys will be able to join us uh, for that as we continue moving forward. Um, uh, so just to make sure everybody's on the same page and I have no idea, um, no idea at all. <laughs> How many weeks that's going to take? I'm not even going to project that one. Um, I'm not saying that I'm going to take, you know, like 35 weeks, but I'm saying I'm not going to predict how many weeks it's going to take me. Um, I mean, heck, I haven't even held the book yet. So how can I possibly say? Um, so anyway, so that's the plan moving forward. And speaking of plans for the immediate future, um, only a few days after the 22nd, when we begin uh, our discussion of the nature of Middle Earth, we are going to have New England moot. Um, so that's going to be on the 25th of September. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, many of you will be able to join us for that. Uh, if you can come in person to Durham, New Hampshire, where uh, the moot will be, that will be awesome. And if you can join us digitally online, that is awesome, too. Um, we're going to be it's going to be a fully hybrid event. All of this, these and the other um, um, uh, the other uh, sessions are going to be uh, both basically both um, uh, digital and on site. Um, <clears throat> Kurt Bloom, you just picked up your copy today. Oh, man, uh, man, I, uh, I, I still don't have mine. Mine didn't arrive today. Um, Stephen, I doubt this will compete with uh, Lamar D'Arthur. It's going to. It's going to be a while, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> before uh, any. I, I think um, Mallory might hold the record for some time uh, of longest Mythgard Academy class. So um, hard to see. Um, I mean, it's not that I can't imagine something that could rival it, but I mean, a seven hundred page poll, you know, a, a seven hundred page book um, in Middle English, like that's. Um, I think it's going to hold the record for a little while. Um, David, I, yes. If someone were to uh, 
if if the entire Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer were to get voted in, that would probably beat it. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, because 36 uh, sessions on the Fairy Queen would mean that we would have to do six sessions per book, which means two cantos per session. Um, and the cantos are much longer uh, in Spencer than they are in Dante. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't see that happening. Um, but anyway, anyway. Um, so, yes, <laughs> so I don't know if that's a personal challenge, if uh, someone is hoping to find a book that uh, will... Um, rival in length uh, Mallory, but in any case, the Fairy Queen would be a good option, I agree. Uh, a likely candidate. But it's not that length of class is necessarily the goal. Um, so, uh, just, so again, just a reminder, we're doing the Nature of Middle-Earth next, and then after the Nature of Middle-Earth, we'll, we'll do an election. Once we start the Nature of Middle-Earth, we'll start up an election for our next non-Tolkien book. Um, and then after that, we'll get back to the history of Middle-earth and we'll do The War of the Jewels, um, the long-awaited sequel to uh, Morgoth's Ring, which will have been delayed, but for good cause. I think uh, uh, tackling the nature of Middle-earth is going to be uh, uh, really exciting and well worth doing. Um, but okay, um, let us... Th oh, and I said New England moot. Don't forget about Middle Moot, too. Middle Moot is the 9th of October, um, and that's in Waterloo, Iowa, for those of you who can get to Iowa. And um, Waterloo, Iowa is um, surprisingly centrally located. It's uh, It should be a drivable, you know, trip um, from, you know, like Chicago, Minneapolis, Kansas City, St. Louis. Um, you can get there from a lot of different places. So um, uh, it's a it's a pretty neat uh, location. Um, but of course, you can also reach it through the internet um, uh, with our digital interaction. So um, anyway, September 25th, October 9th. Those are our two moot dates to come. All right, let us get back into the text. So we were right as um, the earthworms, when earthworms attack, right, is right where we were. They had been hoping and waiting for the attack uh, from Earth, they knew it would have to come. Or that is, they knew they couldn't win if it didn't. And you will recall um, that uh, the goal of the visit to Earth, which, uh, uh, of course, Manny, or Prof and Mike did not tell Manny uh, until after they had left, um, was to ensure that no reasonable compromise was reached, right? Um, because they knew that the only way that Luna could win this, uh, could, you know, win its independence, could win the revolution, <clears throat> is if it was attacked um, by the Earth. Um, that anything else would just lead to a compromise which would lead to precisely the same situation of the depletion of resources on Luna and then therefore... Um, uh, the uh, or in Luna, I should say. I keep making that mistake because I'm such an earthworm. Um, and then, of course, <clears throat> food riots and starvation and cannibalism uh, and all those uh, horrible things, which it is the great end of the revolution to prevent. At least that is certainly Prof's end, as we saw. Um, once again, throughout uh, tonight, one of the sort of subtexts of we'll be spending a lot of time looking at the war itself. Um, but um, one of the subtexts of uh, the uh, the passages from tonight um, is again looking at the contrast between means and ends, and the means, the especially thinking about Prof versus Manny uh, himself, um, and seeing where their comfort and discomfort lies, right? And uh, we saw some of that in Crisis last time, Manny confronting Prof about hypocrisy, right? Um, and Prof sort of defending himself against that, not exactly defending himself against that, at least not effectively defending himself against that. Um, and um, But we, we will see that continue to play itself out as we move forward. But... Let's get back to the war, because at the beginning of the war, um, the situation when war breaks out, um, 
one of the consequences of sort of how that happens is we go back to Manny and Mike, right? We began the story with Manny and Mike, and now in this whole latter string of the um, of the story, there is once again a heavy focus on Manny and Mike and on their relationship, right? And of course, it is that makes it. I was going to say makes it easy to compare. Um, I would say it more strongly than that. It makes it almost inescapable. Um, it's hard not to compare uh, to what we saw back at the beginning, and especially thinking about their relationship, how the two characters have grown. Mike's growth um, is um, Mike's growth is very clear, right? Mike has changed a very great deal in his ability to interact with people uh, from back in the days when, um, you know, uh, Manny was treating him like his particularly awkward country cousin, right? Uh, teaching him some of the basics about how, uh, about human interactions, right? Um, and we just ended last time with what happens at the outbreak of war when Manny is, is, kind of freaking out, right? I mean, he's having a, a very adrenaline-charged emotional reaction, um, uh, which is clouding his judgment uh, in certain places. And we see Mike making all the decisions, right? And doing everything, and doing everything in Manny's name, right? That Manny himself has already, through his own voice, right? Or rather through Mike's facsimile of Manny's voice, um, has already given all these commands. Mike's already done everything that Manny would have done, right, would have chosen to do. And we get instead that uh, instead of seeing Manny act at the moment of crisis, um, you know, sort of stepping forward and, and um, becoming a hero of Luna, right, taking charge, um, we see, we spectate. Manny himself is a spectator of that thing. That is Manuelo Kelly Davis becoming the hero of Luna, right, in the Revolutionary War um, of Luna. Um, and Manny himself is a spectator at that event. Well, auditor, as he sits and listens, right, listens to the sound of his own voice calmly, collectively, um, compassionately, giving all of the essential orders, doing all of the right things in order to set things in motion for the proper defense of Luna when it is under assault, right? And uh, um, the way in which Manny is basically kind of, or Mike, rather, is running the Manny program, right? Here is, here is like, here is what Manny is supposed to do. Right. As if Manny, it's, it's as if Manny himself could be programmed. It's as if Manny is Mike's idiot son. Right. Not exactly. I'm not saying that he treats him that way, but we already we do have. And we'll talk about this in, in a minute. Mike programming this other computer. Right. Um, training this other computer to implement, you know, setting up this other computer to implement the plans and programs that Mike has laid out. Right. Um, and there's a kind of parallel. It's a slightly uncomfortable parallel, right? As he is running the Manny program. Now, he's not actually controlling Manny. Um, it's either better than that or worse than that, right? He impersonates Manny. He stands in for Manny so that Manny doesn't, he, Manny does it, but he doesn't do it. He doesn't have anything to do with it, in fact, right? Um, so we were right in the middle of that. And at the very end of the last scene that we looked at last time, um, Mike told uh, Manny to um, do what he had to do. Right. And Manny goes off to do what he has to do. He goes off to take action, having had everything already done for him. Right. All of the command stuff, all of the important high level stuff already done and handled by Mike. He then leaves Mike to the rest of it picks up his laser gun and puts on his helmet and walks out of the room, right? To go do human stuff, I guess, that the computer can't do. Um, this is, sorry, I forgot I left this uh, uh, slide up here on purpose. Um, it's that last paragraph I wanted to reread. So I went and did what I had to do. 
Mike had played my role as well or better than I could. Finn, when he could be reached, would be handled by Adam. So I left, fast, calling out Greg's message of love to Mum. She was pea-suited and had roused Grandpa and suited him, and suited him in, first time in years. So out I went, helmet closed and laser gun in hand. Out he goes to action, right? Again, action, the thing that Mike can't do for him, right? Couldn't really see what was going on, nor can remember. Just flashes, like girl going over backwards. Don't know who she was, don't know if she survived. Couldn't draw a bead from where I was, too many heads in way. But it was an open counter display, front of a toy shop on my left. I bounced up onto it. Put me a meter higher than causeway pavement, with clear view of earthworms pouring down. Braced self against wall, took careful aim, trying for left chest. Some uncountable time later found that my laser was no longer working, so stopped. Guess eight troopers did not go home because of me, but hadn't counted. And time really did seem endless. Although everybody moving fast as possible looked and felt like instruction movie where everything is slowed to frozen motion. At least once while using up my power pack, some earthworm spotted me and shot back. Was explosion just over my head and bits of shop's wall hit helmet. Perhaps that happened twice. Once out of juice, I jumped down from toy counter, clubbed laser, and joined mob surging against foot of ramp. All this endless time, five minutes, earthworms had been shooting into crowd. You could hear sharp splat and sometimes plop those little missiles made as they exploded inside flesh, or louder pounk if they hit a wall or something solid. Was still trying to reach foot of ramp when I realized they were no longer shooting. We're down. We're dead. Every one of them. We're no longer coming down ramp. Okay, so this is Manny's account of the battle in the corridors. The battle in corridors, as he calls it. Um, uh, this is what he goes and does when he leaves Mike behind and leaves Mike to do all these other things. Um, uh, yeah, carry five minutes seems like a really short time, um, but I can believe it. Um, I can both believe that it did not take very much time for this battle to happen and um, uh, that... Um, uh, and that... Um, it seemed like an enormously long time. Um, yeah, Arthur. When in the pa Arthur asked, when in the past did we see Manny being a man of action? Um, we've seen his inclinations in that direction, right? Um, we certainly saw it when the rape and murder uh, was known, became known, right? Um, he, in fact, defied orders in order to go down and shoot some peace dragoons himself, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I agree that he's transitioned from revolutionary uh, theory to actually fighting and killing. But I don't know, Arthur. I don't see that as a huge transition myself. That is, remember, he's never been a cold theorist, right? Um, and he's always been willing to uh, to take action. Um, remember how immediately he gets involved in the fighting um, when the um, you know when the guards break in to the revolutionary meeting way back in chapter three, right? Um, so uh, he his impulse to fight, um, his desire even at times to fight the. Fighting as a natural expression of his outrage, right? His outrage against the peace dragoons uh, when the rape was, uh, uh, when the rape and murder uh, became known. His um, um, uh, his desire now uh, to fight, right? Right when they're uh, when they're assaulting him, um, Stephen. He doesn't say that he has a combat arm, though he does talk about. Um, he does talk about having some arms that are more... Remember he says things like uh, when he got arrested in Kentucky, that it was lucky that he didn't have, you know, his other arm on him at the time, or else he might have tried, you know, taking him out. Um, so he definitely thinks of some of his arms as more suitable for combat. I don't think he has, like, 
a fully weaponized arm, right, with like rocket launchers and stuff, um, which like might be handy right, in this kind of occasion. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, yeah, exactly, Devorah. At the meeting that was found out by the warden's men, he immediately leapt into combat. So I don't see this as a shift in his character exactly. Um, and of course, one of the things that um, uh, one of the things that we see once again here, right? If there's one thing that we see about Manny in this passage, it's that once again he is the loony on the street, right? Manny has always been Manny's reactions. What Manny will do, won't do, um, is quick to do, slow to do. Culturally speaking, he has always been the prototypical loony. And we see that again, right? Just as we saw it before, how Manny reacted, this like incandescent rage, unwilling, unable even to think about anything else until he had slaked his desire for blood and vengeance um, of the rape and murder, right? Like that so deeply offended um, his uh, his principles, right? His feelings, uh, both his feelings and his beliefs uh, as a loony, um, that he could not just be a cold revolutionary theorist, um, a cold political animal in that moment, and needed to go and shoot somebody. Um, and, uh, um, and, and once again, we see his reaction is exactly what we see, like his um, going to fight um, his rushing into combat, his going to do what he must. Remember, that was how he contextualized this. He's going to go do what he must, um, do what he had to do. And that was pitch in, pitch into the fight. And that's how all of them are doing, All the, including that like young teenage girl um, who jumped up and took a hack at these fully armored uh, and, you know, a uh, huge gun and bayonet wielding um, soldiers with a with a kitchen knife, right, with a cleaver. Um, that's the loony spirit. Um, her, him singling her out, both for the wound that she receives. So she's all she is on the one hand, the court, sort of the symbol of, um, uh, you know, Luna, you know, damaged and wounded and vulnerable uh, in front of these earthworm soldiers, but also her ferocity, right, her. Um, uh, intrepidity of leaping up on the railing and starting to hack at these soldiers with her cleaver as they go by. Um, it makes her a kind of representative loony, but Manny's always been and still remains the number one representative loony. Um, uh, notice how much he emphasizes his role in the battle. Is He's not acting, on the one hand, he's not acting especially heroically, right? Like he doesn't come in and take, like immediately take control of the situation, right? And lead the loonies in a rout of the earthworms and everyone afterwards is like, hooray, we old it all to, you know, old Cobber uh, Davis over there. Like that's not what happens. Um, he doesn't command anybody. He doesn't seem to exert any leadership at all that we can see, right? Um, uh, he has no big picture view um, of what's going on here. He just pitches in shoulder to shoulder with everybody else, right? That's how he acts. That's what he does. And again, that's in some ways, that's been his role all the way through, right? He is the loony on the street embodied in, you know, the first the conspiracy, uh, then the revolution, and then the war, right? Um, so, but at the same time, there of course is something heroic about him. Again, now this doesn't, the point that this makes is that like all of the loonies are heroic, right? As he's going to go on and emphasize uh, in just a, uh, in, 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 I think the next passage. Um, but, um, but we see his courage, Right. We see his courage. We see the uh, um, the. Well, it's not quite self-sacrifice, but um, his willingness to make, you know, his uh, lack of self-regard. Right. Um, with which his courage is manifest, his jumping up 
on this toy counter, making himself a perfect target, right? While he, in order to enable him to shoot uh, his laser gun uh, at the earthworms over the heads uh, of the loonies, right? Um, the casual way in which he talks about like, yeah, one of those like, you know, exploding shells uh, struck just above my head. Maybe a couple times that happened, right? Um, I mean, obviously he is being singled out by snipers um, who are missing him because it's the moon. We'll talk about that in a minute too. But um, but nevertheless, um, he is very much in danger. And then when that's done, he just jumps down and uses his laser gun as a club uh, in hand-to-hand combat against as many soldiers as he can reach with the rest of the mob, right? And that's how... That's how he goes. That's his contribution to the battle in the quarter. So as I say, it is both simultaneously a humble role, an indistinct role. It's not a distinguished role, right? Not the kind of like, and this person turned the tide of the battle of the corridors, right? Sorry, battle in corridors. Um, too many, uh, too many particles in that sentence. Um, it's, you know, history books shouldn't write it that way because that's not what happened. Um, and yet, um, his role is, in a different way, heroic. Heroic because here he is, General O'Kelly Davis, um, just fighting soldier to soldier with the common people in this warren um, as they are trying to repel the invader off of their soil. Um, and I think that that's really... I think it's a fascinating characterization. Um, and it begins... Devora, to bring me back around to the question that you asked originally that we've been looking at um, and we're talking about some again last week. Why is he right? Who is he writing this to? Who's his audience? And therefore, the corollary, why is he writing this? What is the motivation of this book? And it begins, I think, to becoming clearer and clearer the further we go along, right? Why is he writing this? Because what was written in the histories is just so wrong, as he said. Now, he doesn't explicitly tell us what's written in the histories because his audience presumably knows, presumably was raised on those histories, right? They all had to learn them at school because they probably have schools now uh, in Luna. Um, He does seem to want the record straight. To set the record straight. And about what? I'm beginning to think uh, that it's first and foremost about himself, about his own role. He is, General O'Kelly Davis, is doubtless remembered in great honor in those histories, which talk about the battle in corridors, for instance, and the role that he played. Um, And what he is revealing here in his narrative is not that he did nothing, right? Though, remember, he starts off, he contextualizes it with, <clears throat> I was caught with my pea suit down, right? I didn't have my pea suit with me and thus missed half the battle. <clears throat> so he starts with um, a very humble move, talking about how he himself was totally taken by surprise and um, was did not even himself follow the preparations that he and the rest of the war cabinet were insisting everybody follow. Um, but, but what else, right? Um, in addition, of course, we have the fact that, um, he didn't even do all of the things for which he is doubtless in part remembered, right? A lot of what is in the history books is doubtless drawn from accounts of the orders that he gave, right? I mean, I'm sure there would be many people, starting with Finn uh, and on down, who, um, uh, you know, Finn Nielsen, who who will tell the story afterwards, right? How Manny kept his head in the time of crisis and was right there when everyone needed him, giving the uh, necessary instructions, making the right decisions. Um, and so, and then, of course, there will doubtless also be some who remember him there, right? Seeing him there in the battle, Um you know, who look around and find General O'Kelly Davis right there in their midst uh, when the earthworms have been defeated. Um, put those two things together 
and you have a pretty good heroic day um, by this uh, uh, great revolutionary figure, right? This founding father of, of Luna. Um, but he didn't do most of that, right? Um, and I think... Uh, so that's that's the, that's the shape of it that I'm beginning to see anyway as we move forward. Um, now... I love this passage. Um, I've said from the beginning, one of the things I admire most about this book is Heinlein's world building, which I find really uh, convincing, um, really compelling even. Um, and I love. there's so many things that he has thought through really, really well. Um, and what's more, I would add, thought through in ways that are peculiarly important, I think, personally, for a science fiction writer to think through. Um, just as, uh, you know, I think it's important if you are, you know, so fantasy and science fiction, imaginative literature, right, are all based on the same premise, right? You've got a work of literature which starts with a what if, right? What if this were true? Um, you know, what if there were a world where X, right? But of course, you don't vary everything in the world. Some things in the world work the same uh, as, uh, uh, as in the world that we know, or else there would be no point of contact at all. Um, uh, but there's a, there's, a, there's a substantial what if underlying it, right? And how, to me, always, one of the things that determines whether or not a work of imaginative literature is, in my opinion anyway, successful, is how well they play out the what-if scenario. How thoughtfully and interestingly they think that through and build a really interesting story in and around that premise, right? That uh, uh, that what-if concept that they begin with. Um, and uh, so... Of course, obviously, the what the what if for Heinlein in this uh, in this book, right? The foundational what, uh, what if is what if there were a colony on the moon, right? Um, and a you know over the course of generations, a new society were beginning to and it you know and and of course there's lots of lots of uh, additional clauses, right? And if that uh, you know uh, colony had started in this way as a prison colony, and if like the political situation in uh, you know on the on the earth had developed in this particular way, and all those kinds of things, right? Um, so Tomas, I don't think I don't count like family structure in Luna as a what if. Instead, I count that as one of the ways the what if works out, right? That seems to me to be one of the conclusions that he comes to, right? When he says, okay, so what if this had happened? So his what if is, what if there were a prison colony in Luna, right? Which kind of developed into its own semi-independent, you know, or at least sort of separate, anyhow, society, right? Like we see in Luna, Um the ways in which family structure would develop differently than it did on Earth is one of his conclusions. Like, it's one of the consequences of that proposition, right? Of the, the kind of the framework that he initially establishes. Well, of course, one of the major differences, and we've seen it many times, um, that he, I think, does a really, really good job of thinking about is the gravity. Right. That the you know, one of the primary, but certainly not the only, but one of the primary differences um, of in your society in Luna is going to be the low gravity. Right. Given the gravity of the moon, um, how is that going to impact everything in society? Because it would. I mean, it would impact things that we wouldn't even think about. Um, I can't help but think of uh, but remember Remember in um, uh, C.S. Lewis glanced at this in Out of the Silent Planet when we discussed that last year. Um, remember that when he was on Melacondra, which was also a lighter world, right, with a lower gravity than ours. Uh, and so he was imagining that, right, and everything being more vertical and stuff. So Lewis did a lot of really interesting imagining about a low uh, gravity environment. Um, 
and um, and you, you may remember the um, the scene when Ransom was being interviewed by the Sorns, and they were asking him about how things worked, you know, um, on Earth, and th- he says as narrator um, that one of the things they were chiefly struck by was how very much of the the energy and resources of human society were dedicated to lifting and moving things. Um, and I, I, I just that as a point of contrast, right, it was I think was as a really interesting insight. Very true. How would that change things? How would that make things different? Anyway, one of the differences, of course, between Heinlein and Lewis is that Heinlein knew a little more science and a lot more math <laughs> than C.S. Lewis did, right? Um, C.S. Lewis struggled with arithmetic, uh, as he freely admits. You know, he he uh, uh, in his uh, autobiography, "Surprised by Joy," uh, he talked about like the careers that he couldn't enter into. Uh, because, uh, in his words, because down that road, the demon mathematics lurked. <laughs> so, and he couldn't pass a math test uh, to save his life. So uh, nothing that he had to pass a ma- you know, uh, math uh, exams for at school um, could, he, um, uh, could, he, could he pursue. Anyway, Heinlein, not the case, right? Um, and so, as I say, I love... The how thoroughly he thinks this through, and this is a really fun one, um, in a couple different ways. All through Luna, invaders were dead. If not that instant, then shortly. Over two thousand troopers dead. More than three times that number of loonies died in stopping them. Plus, perhaps as many loonies wounded. A number never counted. No prisoners taken in any warren. Although we got a dozen officers and crew from each ship when we mopped up. A major reason why loonies, mostly unarmed, were able to kill armed and trained soldiers lay in fact that a freshly landed earthworm can't handle himself well. Our gravity, one-sixth what he is used to, makes all his lifelong reflexes his enemy. He shoots high without knowing it, is unsteady on feet, can't run properly, feet slide out from under him. Still worse, those troopers had to fight downwards. They necessarily broke in at upper levels, then had to go down ramps again and again to try to capture a city. And earthworms don't know how to go down ramps. Motion isn't running, isn't walking, isn't flying, is more a controlled dance, with feet barely touching and simply guiding balance. A loony three-year-old does it without thinking, comes down skipping in a guided fall, touching toes touching every few meters. But an earthworm new chums it, Finds self walking on air. He struggles, rotates, loses control, winds up at bottom, unhurt, but angry. Um, As I say, I love the thinking through here. This is, you know, he describes this. And I'm like, that's exactly right. And notice, like, why is he describing all this? Because there's an obvious question that he feels needs to be answered. Manny feels needs to be answered. More importantly, I think Heinlein feels it needs to be answered. A question which might possibly trip up, um, might force readers out of secondary belief and into mere suspension of disbelief, right? How how is it? So they were unarmed, right? They had no armor. They had no weapons. And yet you're telling me that these people were able to kill unarmed and trained soldiers. There were thousands of trained and armed, well-armed soldiers. Um, And they were not able just to mow down these civilians who were coming at them with knives and fists. Um, How is that? How does that work? How is that possible? Um, And um, the answer, uh, and he, he has an answer, right? The answer is, the moon is a harsh mistress, right? They have learned the lessons of the moon, right? Um, they're not new chums, uh, fresh come uh, to Luna. They know what they're doing. They have learned how to operate in the moon. They have acclimated themselves. They've been born, most of them, in this world, right? This is their world, and it's a different world. Um, I, pers- speaking for myself, I don't think I would ever have thought of the fact that you would shoot high, without knowing it. Of course you would. 
because when you learn to aim a gun, you are learning to account for the effect of gravity on your bullet, right? Because the laws of projectile motion tell you that every that gravity is constantly acting downwards on your bullet. So you always have to aim a little higher than your target and higher still, depending how far away you are, because you have to account for the effect of gravity, even on a bullet moving at high speed. Um, and you can't practice that. Right. You can't practice shooting in, 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 in the, on the moon's gravity. Right. All of their training, far from preparing them to, you know, mow down uh, the unarmed civilians of Luna would be, as he says, their enemy. Um, and um, that's and that works for me. And I love the way in which and his thing about the ramps. Right. I mean, again, like that totally works for me. Under what circumstances will a group of unarmed civilians be able to take out an armed soldier every time? Answer, when he's on his back on the ground, that's when, right? If, if the soldier is down and can't bring his gun to bear and they can jump on him and stab him, yeah, that's when uh, uh, a group of civilians can take out soldiers every time. Right. And so, yeah, no, it makes the, the ramp thing. It makes total sense. Um, and it's um, it's delightful um, that um, it's delightful that uh, this is also um, a really fun reversal of terrestrial military doctrine. Right. I mean, for millennia, literally millennia. Right the the most one of the most important factors in an infantry battle is who has the high ground the one who has the high ground coming downhill um at the enemy has a massive advantage in momentum on a charge right just like gravity is helping your weapon right as it comes down upon your enemy i mean in every single way um almost every single way uh, having the high ground gives you an enormous military advantage. Um, and that's always been true, right? Except here, it's um, uh, it's delightfully um, it's delightfully reversed, right? Um, and that's um, that's, I think, just it's it's fun. Right. That's fun. But it's not just a, a kind of a, a, a fun and ironic fact. It's a wonderful kind of snapshot of this entire world that he's built. Right. Um, the moon is it's has set on its head so many things, uh, you know, so many of your instincts from Earth are going to be. um ill-suited to your survival on the moon, right? Um, uh, if you just, if you don't learn, if you don't adjust, if you remain, if if you knew Chumit, right, as Manny says here. Um, and that, that's been one of the running themes all the way through. And that goes all the way from military doctrine like this, all the way down to social practices. Like apparently it's perfectly acceptable on Earth. Uh, for men to force their attentions on women. Uh, men, even nice men like Stu, do that without thinking anything of it, right? That sense of uh, that assumption of masculine superiority, of masculine privilege, sexually speaking, um, that's an earthworm thing. That's endemic in the earthworm culture, we're told. But if you apply that in Luna, you're going to... Um, get evacuated in the first couple of days, as Stu almost did, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but of course, there's the other thing too, right? Um, this is the second sense in which we've talked about the high ground. Um, the first time we talked about it was when we were talking about their appeals to the 
um, authority down in Agra, right, in India, Prof and Manny. Um, they were trying to hold the high ground and kind of force the uh, authority to um, to take the low ground, right, to explicitly treat them like slaves because they wanted to make them look bad and make themselves look good in the eyes of the earth, but much more importantly, in the eyes of the loonies, right? Um, they wanted to maintain the moral high ground um, and push and prod gently, indirectly, to manipulate uh, the leaders of Earth into vacating the moral high ground, right? Um, now we see the issue of the high ground coming in, tactically speaking. But of course, all of this is going to be um, set up, David, exactly as you're saying. Um, it's all, in the end, it's all about the high ground, right? The gravitational high ground. Um, as on a large scale, on a, on a strategic rather than a merely tactical uh, way, um, the moon has the ultimate and most radical high ground advantage over Earth than any combatant has ever enjoyed over another, right? Because of the gravitational will of the planet. Um, yeah, Stephen, you were just thinking the same thing. Exactly. Um, okay, but let's keep going. And that was the was biggest reason why we loonies won. We fought. Most loonies never laid eyes on a live invader, but whenever troops broke in, loonies rushed in like white corpuscles and fought. Nobody told them. Our feeble organization broke down under surprise, but we loonies fought berserk and invaders died. No trooper got farther down than level six in any warren. They say that people in Bottom Alley never knew we were invaded until over. But invaders fought well, too. These troops were not only crack riot troops, best, uh, best peace enforcers for city work FN had. They also had been indoctrinated and drugged. Indoctrination had told them, correctly, that their only hope of going Earthside again was to capture warrens and pacify them. If they did, they were promised relief and no more duty in Luna. But was win or die, for it was pointed out that their transports could not take off if they did not win, as they had to be replenished with reaction mass, impossible without first capturing Luna. And this was true. Then they were loaded with energizers, don't worries, and fear inhibitors that would make mouse spit at cat and turned loose. They fought professionally and quite fearlessly and died. Um, Manny opines near the beginning of this whole revolutionary process that he doesn't really understand patriotism and that loonies as a whole, they don't get patriotism. Any of them that experienced anything like patriotism um, would, have, uh, w would have been for the countries they came from on Earth originally. Right. Um, if it meant anything, that's what it would have meant to them. Nobody felt patriotic about Luna, about Looney society specifically. Right. Um, even him. And we even had that moment after they came back from Earth where Manny says kind of hesitatingly, maybe this is what patriotism was like. Right. When he's uh, reuniting with his family and they all put on uh, 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 liberty caps and he gets kind of teared up, uh, you know, about it and everything. Um, and he's like, maybe this is kind of like um, um, uh, uh, maybe this is kind of like what uh, um, what patriotism is like. But I think in this passage we can see he definitely knows what patriotism is like. Right. Look at the way he talks. We fought. Why we loonies won. We fought. Um, um, look how proud he is about the fierceness with which they fight. Um, we loonies fought berserk and invaders died. Um, they had training. They had indoctrin indoctrinization. They had supplies and weapons. They had drugs, right? They were loaded with energizers, don't worries, and fear inhibitors that would make mouse spit at cat. Um, but, and what did the loonies have? Courage, determination, right? They didn't need to be told, right? They didn't need to be organized. 
our organization broke down. He is not proud of himself, of his army, of his command, right? He is seems to be actively deflecting. And here again, Devor is where I'm coming back to my theory, right? He seems to be actively deflecting any glory away from himself, right? It's not he that deserves credit for what happened that day. It's the loonies themselves that deserve credit. It's all loonies. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, um, uh, so, um, and numbers, Stephen, right? But, but that's also the point, right? Numbers, yes, but numbers only because they have, because they're all fighting, right? Um, men, women, young, old, boys, girls of every, of all ages, right? All of them are fighting. That's what he's so proud of, right? Um, they're fighting like white blood cells, right? Just, 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 um, you know, clogging up a wound site, right? Um, that's, that's what they did. That's how they fought. Um, so yeah, they had numbers. They wouldn't, if they had been, trained, a trained traditional army, right? Had, uh, if they had had five years, you know, to kind of whip together and train an official loony standing army to attempt to repel the invaders, they wouldn't have anything, we wouldn't have had anything like the numbers that they had here at the Battle in Corridors. Because the numbers seem to include almost everyone, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's and Manny is palpably proud of that. In the end, I think that his his own patriotism has ob has obviously grown. Um, and it's interesting because, of course, he t spoke freely about how they were attempting to manipulate this response in the loonies, right? Um, they wanted to induce loonies to feel, you know, from like Adam Saline's uh, poem, right, that got that got published, um, uh, you know, all the way through, um, you know, all, uh, the other the situations they were trying to maneuver with the Peace Dragoons back before the Warden was overthrown and everything. Um, they were trying to induce loonies to feel patriotism. It has grown here. Um, it has grown not spontaneously, because it wasn't spontaneous, right? But at the same time, it was not merely a success. And that, that's, I think, what he's really pointing to here. The success, them winning these battles is not a consequence, ultimately, of the successful machinations of Prof, Mike, and, uh, you know, the revolutionary executive cell. Um, they have not brought this about. They didn't make this happen. Manny is pretty clear about the fact that this happens, that this worked, that they, that they won because of what loonies are like, right? Because of who the loonies are. Um, and that seems to be where he is, uh, uh, where he's wanting to go and what he's wanting to be. Um, and so, Sarah, in a sense, yeah, Prof's propaganda definitely does supercharge them. We see how effective his rhetoric is and and his, remember his uh, pastiche uh, speech, right, from Churchill and, and uh, other great uh, wartime figures. Um, so, yeah, he has definitely, um, his rhetoric has had its effect, no question. Um, but at the end of the day, it isn't that. Notice the contrast that he's making, right? They had indoctrinization. The soldiers, the Earth soldiers did, right? The loonies weren't indoctrinated. They're, they've kind of been trying, Prof has kind of been trying, in a way, to indoctrinate the loonies. Um, but that's not what makes it happen. And again, I think he's pretty clear in the contrast there. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, back to Mike. So he and Finn, my, uh, Manny and Finn, that is not Mike, uh, Manny and Finn go and, um, attack the transport ship, right? And blow holes in it. 
uh, with their uh, with their with their lasers, their um, uh, their drills. Um, and uh, so he's going to weave into it. <laughs> I love though. I didn't quote it, but I love the line um, when uh, Mike tells Finn to tell him his plan. And Finn says, if I tell you, you'll just find reasons why it won't work. Um, and and he tells him to leave him alone. And Manny makes that uh, comment that I just love about how he's like, I have heard of armies uh, where commanders are not told to shut up by their subordinates. Um, I, I, I really loved that line. But anyway, after that, he says, decided Finn knew how to run his show without my sloppy help, so went back inside, called Mike, and asked for Capsule to go out to ballistic radars. He wanted to know why I didn't stay inside where it was safe. I said, listen, you upstart collection of semiconductors. You are merely a minister without portfolio, while I am minister of defense. I ought to see what's going on, and I have exactly two eyeballs, while you've got eyeballs spread over half of Chrysium. Are you trying to hog fun? He told me not to jump salty and offered to put his displays on a video screen, say in room L of Raffles. Did not want me to get hurt. And, and had I heard joke about Drillman who hurt his mother's feelings? I said, Mike, please let me have a capsule. Can pea suit and meet it outside Station West, which is in bad shape, as I'm sure you know. Okay. One of the things that I think we see a lot um, that I really enjoy about the ending stretch of this book are the ways in which Heinlein very subtly showcases both the shortcomings of computers and the shortcomings of, like, the strength and, and shortcomings of humans and computers, right? Um, and, um, uh, and Carrie, yeah, the phrase jump salty is a pretty awesome and I think very useful phrase. Um, uh, Yeah. Um, what do we see of human weakness here? What are the so? What are strengths and weaknesses? We could do a. If I had a whiteboard, which I could get, but I'm too lazy. Um, we could do a. We could do a, a a grid, right? I could divide it into four quadrants, and we could put human and computer strengths and weaknesses uh, in the four quadrants. Um, so let's start. Let's start with uh, with computer strengths. How about that? Start with computer strengths. Um, what do you uh, what do we see of computer strengths here? Right, Devor Good. He can see everything and be everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. He's not limited um, to two eyeballs. Right. He's got lots of eyeballs. Right. Um, so his sensory input is not only far greater than Manny's, but flexible, adaptable, and expandable, right? Yep, yep. Speed uh, and multitasking, absolutely. His ability to do many things at once, yep. Not getting clouded by emotion or fatigue, yep. That very, very important, yep. Good, Tomas and Devora on that one, absolutely. Um, uh, good, Jocelyn, no need to sleep, on day and night. Yeah, we see, we saw that kind of gently at the beginning, right? Um, remember, there was that one passage fairly early on when they're still in planning stages when um, they all have to sleep and, and Mike kind of, uh, like Adam Celine yawns, right? But it's all a fake, right? Of course, Mike is going to, goes on working all through the time that they're sleeping as, as we're told. Yeah, yeah. Um, how about human strengths? The human strengths that we can see highlighted, uh, especially in this passage here. Having a harder time pointing to human strengths? Yeah, Jocelyn, understanding the human condition. Yeah, yeah. Um, would Mike decide that Finn knew how to run his show without his sloppy help? The way that Manny is able to handle his subordinate and friend here, Finn, right, um, is something I'm not sure Mike would have executed in exactly the same way, right? Yeah, good. As and Ellen, and just as you said it, um, Manny can tell when it's better for him to step back. Yes, yes. Um, good. Stephen says prioritizing without hard data. Yes, yes, absolutely. 
Um, uh, good. How about um, how about human weaknesses? Human weaknesses in this passage. Oh, David, wait, I like that. Um, uh, David says, Manny is not bound by the odds. Right from the beginning, we saw him willing to take seven to one odds. Remember um, when um, uh, that first disconnect? Remember when um, uh, Mike first does the first odds calculation, uh, their chances of winning? And says, "I'm sorry. Like it's 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 okay, terrible news, right? There's there's only a one in seven chance that this will work." And they all start celebrating and kissing each other, and Mike doesn't get it at all. Um, yeah, I agree. And we can even see that. We can even see we can see that at work in the battle situations as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now weakness. Um, Oh, Bruce, that's also really good. Another good human strength I was missing there. Man, uh, uh, man has emotional skin in the game. Yeah, yeah. There's a kind of investment that Manny has in this that Mike does not have and seems not even really able uh, to understand. But human weaknesses, uh, some of them are kind of just the reverse of the computer strengths, right? Like, Jocelyn, as you say, emotional responses clouding judgment, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah and of course the physical weaknesses and limitations that are you know opposite to uh, some of the computer strengths we were talking about limited memory capacity Tomas yeah yeah absolutely greater need for safety greater vulnerability right personal vulnerability absolutely yeah ability to get hurt yeah exactly exactly um, yeah and I, David I think you're right um the need to do something, even if it's pointless. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, yeah, insufficient detachment, right? We can see, you know, Manny's... Um, now, when he calls Mike an upstart collection of semiconductors, um, I don't think he's being super earnest here. Like, I think he's... Um, I think that there's, I'm not saying that Manny's joking, that I don't think that would be a fair characterization of this. Um, but I don't think he's 100% not joking either. Um, I think that there is some deliberate humor involved in what he says and how he says it there. Um, I mean, after all, seriously, Manny, of all people, is going to pull rank you are merely a minister without portfolio, while I am a minister of defense. I do not believe that he means that genuinely, right? That he's like earnestly and passionately urging his... But he doesn't care about any of those positions, right? Manny thinks that's all nonsense from the beginning, right? I agree, Bruce. I think it's hobbitry uh, to cross the streams a little bit there. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Ellen, I think that's a great way of saying it. He is channeling his irritation at Mike telling him what to do into humor. Um, it is, it's a deliberate humor that he's using, right? And yet it's actual irritation. He's not just joking. Um, so yeah, I think that that's exactly right. And yet, Stephen, I agree. You trying to hog fun um, is a very clear indicator, I think. I agree with you. Um, a very clear indicator um, that he's poking fun at the situation, that he's not just in deadly earnest from one end of that paragraph to the next. Um, what do we see about computer weaknesses in this passage? What are some some computer weaknesses at work here? Yeah, Devorah, I, I agree. He doesn't understand what his friend needs. Yeah, Devorah, Ellen, and David are all thinking of similar kinds of things. And Stephen, I think that you're right too. In in the same sort of way, he's his inability to prioritize abstractly, right? Um, uh, 
he's not wrong, right? Manny doesn't have to be there. He's analyzing it and saying, does Manny's physical presence, um, you know, at the, um, where's he going? To the uh, ballistic radars, right? Um, he wants to go out to the ballistic radars. Why? What's he going to do there? Right? What is he going to change by being there? Will his pre- physical presence in that location increase or decrease their chances of success? No. Right? However, it will increase his chances of getting hurt. And his getting hurt or killed will decrease their chances of success. So this is an obvious calculation, which Mike makes immediately. You should not go. Um you should not go if you want to see, right? Because you've only got your two eyeballs. I can show you all the things you need. Um, but he absolutely cannot understand how Manny kicking back and putting his feet up in a private room and watching everything unfolding on screens in front of him. It may be that his own personal contribution might not be more significant than that. Right. Or even that conceivably he could perhaps contribute even more from that position. But that, although it seems like a complete no brainer, doesn't necessarily make Mike correct about that. I think that there are a lot of things um, that Mike doesn't really understand. Um Jocelyn, that's exactly the kind of direction that I was thinking. Um, uh, Jocelyn says, we don't know it won't change things. Fighters are inspired by seeing their leaders in the line of fire with them, shoulder to shoulder. And Stephen Keene had just said, Mike still doesn't understand why shoulder to shoulder matters, right? The shoulder to shoulder thing's a big deal. Right. Um, that's been a uh, the shoulder to shoulder motif has been running throughout the entire book. Right. From Wyo's speech uh, and that meeting at the beginning where Manny himself taking a much more computer like analysis of the situation. Right. Was um, uh, was arguing that this shoulder to shoulder nonsense was a null program. Right. Um, and then, of course, his. Self-deprecating. um uh, crack about the fact that they eventually marched into the warden's uh, residence shoulder to shoulder, right? Um, but yeah, there, it's not a no program. Just as oratory is not a no program, as Manny asserted back at that first meeting, it's not true. These intangible things do in fact matter. It does make a difference. Manny will in fact do more good. Not only will Manny do more good being out there with the with the other people fighting than he would being in a quiet room by himself watching these things on a monitor, but actually even endangering himself, um, uh, even endangering himself is um, uh, uh, is beneficial potentially, right? Um, has gains. It reminds me of that wonderful story that uh, Tom Shippey told in his Mythmoot talk uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the British general uh, that he was quoting, uh, that he was telling the story about. Um, but he was telling the story about this British general who was uh, being criticized by his subordinates for um, uh, uh, putting himself uh, in danger. Um, and, uh, his subordinate says to him, um, you know, general, it'd be terrible for the men's morale if you were to be killed. Um, and, uh, Tom quotes the general as saying, nonsense, nothing inspires a British soldier like a dead general. Um, and he's right. Right. And there's definitely, um, um, uh, there's definitely there's definitely some uh, some truth in that. But anyway, the, whether or not that's actually true, the point is that um, uh, it's it's the exactly the kind of thing Manny does not get right now. Um, David, you're exactly correct that Mike's sense of humor is still off too. Look at how Mike <laughs> is. Like wildly inappropriately multitasking in the middle of this situation, right? Um, um, 
did not want me to get hurt. And I, had I heard joke about drill man who hurt his mother's feelings? Um, had I heard joke about right in the middle of this? And uh, and David, I think that your perception is very keen there. Um, David is is arguing that Mike has picked up on the fact that Manny is using humor. Manny just made a joke, right? You trying to hog fun. Um, he's picking up on the tone. Okay, oh, we're being funny now, right? Humor is being deployed. This is the place for humor. Okay, so have you heard joke about Drillman who hurt his mother's feelings, right? Um, and he's still not... So as... As much as Mike has learned, I mean, remember that Manny performance with Greg, right? When he was train, when he was uh, in, uh, uh, impersonating um, Manny, and even Manny himself thinks that he did a perfect job of like imitating not only what he would say, but the tone in which he would say it, and the awkward half choke in his voice when he did say it, um, all that stuff. Um, he's like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, Mike totally nailed it, right? He gets all this stuff now. But he still doesn't get this, right? He still doesn't get this. Um, and Arthur, but Arthur, I agree with you. Mike also misses the old days, right? In part, this is a deliberate callback by Mike, right? An attempt to reconnect with Manny on the old terms, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh Okay, let's keep going. So, he calls Mike near the end of the battle, right? This is not Gospodin Selene, Mike answered in a strange voice. This is one of his assistants. Adam Selene was in Churchill Upper when it lost pressure. I'm afraid that we must assume that he is dead. What? I am very sorry, Gospodin. Hold phone. Chased a couple of drillmen and a girl out of room, then sat down and lowered hush hood. Mike, I said softly, private now. What is this gum beating? Man, he said quietly, think it over. Adam Selene had to go some day. He served his purpose and is, as you pointed out, almost out of the government. Professor and I have discussed this. The only question has been the timing. Can you think of a better last use for Adam than to have him die in this invasion? It makes him a national hero, and the nation needs one. Let it stand that Adam Selene is probably dead until you can talk to Professor. If he still needs Adam Selene, it can turn out that he was trapped in a private pressure and had to wait to be rescued. Well, okay, let it stay open. Personally, I always preferred your Mike personality anyhow. I know you do, man, my first and best friend, and so do I. It's my real one. Adam was a phony. That sentence is a little bit mind-blowing when you think about it. Adam was a phony, right? Um... When we think about the way in which Mike has been constructing his own kind of world, his own um, personality from uh, from the beginning, right? Um, <laughs> sorry, I missed Stephen's comment about Mike's joke. Uh, Mike, that's a funny at a different time. Yes, uh, that would be the proper response. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Arthur, yeah, absolutely, Mike and Prof are making decisions without Manny around. Once again, Manny is finding out about it secondhand. He didn't need to know that. He didn't need to be a part of that decision. Um, now, notice he's still, Mike is still perfectly, I mean, he's not like taking over, right? He's not pushing Manny out, perfectly willing to let Manny have a voice in this, right? I mean, he can help to decide whether or not Adam stays dead. Um, uh, but yeah, they're putting the plan in motion. They're putting the plan together. Um, this is not a business of like elaborate secrecy. Like before they were deliberately manipulating Manny. This doesn't seem to be one of those cases, but yeah, absolutely. Mike and, uh, Mike and, um, uh, prof are absolutely running the show, right? There's really no question about that. Now, Manny doesn't even want to run the show really. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, And that last, um, those, those last comments, right? And of course he's going to go on, Mike is going to go on to call Adam the stuffed shirt, right? Uh, he actively dislikes Adam Selene and having to be Adam Selene. Um, like what is it that we see here? Well, um, 
he, Mike, is differentiating between his own persona, right? His own personality. He has a real personality, right? Now, notice that Manny's wording doesn't necessarily imply that, does it? I always preferred your Mike personality anyhow, which seems almost to imply or at least be open to the interpretation that Manny believes that Mike has multiple personalities that can be pulled out at will. Now, that seemed to be confirmed in that first evening with Wyo, right? The Michelle personality uh, who came out uh, with Wyo then. Um, and Sarah, yeah, I agree. We, 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 we've never heard from Michelle again. But I have to think, Sarah, that Mike still speaks in the Michelle persona whenever he's speaking privately to Wyo just as he speaks to Manny in his Mike persona um, every time he's speaking uh, uh, privately with Manny. Um, so I think it's just the fact that we never see Manny and we, we never get Mike interacting with, uh, uh, with Wyo privately after that first time. Um, but, uh, but anyway, certainly that scene suggested seems to have suggested to Manny and I think suggested to us that or at least to, to create the question does Mike in fact have a real personality something that is really him right um or aren't all of his personalities um Adam Celine most self-consciously because you know it was a, a group decision right that collaborated on Adam Celine um so most self-consciously Adam Celine but even but and Michelle fairly clearly right in response to Wyo um but even Mike but here's my question maybe this doesn't mean when Mike says it's my real one what exactly does he mean by that i wonder I wonder if he means that's the one that I choose, right? And that he gives the kind of key to that earlier in the sentence, right? Man, my first and best friend, right? I know you do, man, my first and best friend, and so do I. Um, his, he, because he considers his friendship with Manny to be primary, right? To be the first and most important thing in his life. Call that life. Um, <laughs> it's, it's hard not to start quoting Marvin uh, when you start talking about Mike too much. But anyway, um, um, so um, anyway, when he says, it's my real one, I wonder if that's, as we might say, his preference, right? His choice. I have, I can adopt any of these persona. They're all constructed in a sense. And the sense in which they're all constructed, I mean, so it might seem to say, it might seem to be questioning Mike's personhood to say that he doesn't have a real personality. Right. Um, I could imagine somebody saying, well, no, hey, wait a second. Are you saying that Mike's not real? Mike's not a real person, actually, after all. Um, the, you know, don't you believe that Mike's real and that he because that would mean he would have a real person. Of course he would. Right. If you say that all of his personalities are fake on some level, then aren't you saying that he's not a real person? Well, no, because remember what he's not. Is he's not a human. Right. He's a person, but he's not a human. What he's been doing has been artificially constructing a fake human-like persona to connect with humans. And that he was making the effort to come across, you know, that he and Manny, right, were kind of across a divide, though Manny was so much closer to him than any other human, right, both because he understood computers and could speak their language both literally and figuratively. 
Um, but also, of course, the way that he even he symbolically in his own person, as we say, kind of straddles that line between human and machine, as we've said from the from the start. Um, so it was there was a lesser gap to bridge between him and Manny than between him and any other human. However, that bridging is still him bridging the gap. He's still coming to Manny. He wants to understand humans. He wants to be more like humans. Maybe, sort of. At least that's how he talks. That's how he connects with them. That's how he relates to them. But this whole idea of a personality and what it means to have a personality and that's all of it is constructed. Right? To say that he has no real personality, I believe that Manny does imply that he believes Mike doesn't have a real personality. That he's saying, of your constructed personalities, I like the Mike one the best, I think is what he means when he says that. But I don't think that that means that Manny secretly doesn't really believe that he's actually a person. I think instead it shows that he understands better than anybody else that Adam, the Adam, listen to me, that Mike, though a person, is not a human. He's a computer and different, therefore, is not going to have a personality in the same way that humans have personalities. Um, yeah, Stephen Manny named him Mike. Manny gave him that name. Yes. Um, Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, now, Bruce, I agree that the first evidence that Manny had, the first evidence that Mike was alive was his first joke, right? That is, so it, So I agree with you that the jokester, um, the one who is fascinated by humor, does in that way seem to be his real personality in some sense. But again, um, even that... The way that he is learning, like the research that he's doing into humor, is still a process of him bridging the gap, right? He's fascinated by the concept of humor, um, and he enjoys jokes. Um, so th there is something that really that really does point to um, kind of the um, the essence, right, of what his personhood is like, what his mind is like. Um, I mean, if there's one piece of data that we have to tell us something about what Mike the person, Mike the consciousness, Mike the um, awareness is like, right? What is the nature of that thing? It is his fascination with humor, right? It doesn't necessarily mean he's a funny guy, right? No, not necessarily. I don't think that's what it tells us. Right? It's much more complicated than that. Um, it's that he both perceives and is fascinated by and um, persistently interested in the phenomenon of humor. Um, if I had to try to name it, that thing, that thing which is the essence of his personality, even that thing... Bruce, if I could take your comment one step further and say that thing that makes him a person, I would describe it as an awareness, a constructive awareness of the other, of something that is not you, unlike you, and that engenders curiosity to learn more about it, right? Because humor, um, as Manny's come back to several times, um, everyone assumes that if you put honest data into a computer, you're going to get honest data out, right? Um, that is, the, the word always points to the thing, right? There's no, it, humor is about you know, double meanings and, um, you know, setting up an, expe an expectation which gets disappointed in a different way. It's all about the tension and the breakages uh, between sign and signifier, right? I mean, between 
you know, word and thing between, you know, all that stuff, right? That's, that's kind of the essence of humor. Um, and that's exactly what computers don't do um, natively, right? Um, and uh, Mike perceives it, and he's fascinated by it. And that perception and fascination seem to me absolutely uh, fundamental to the concept of his personhood. But again, that's not quite the same thing as saying um, Mike's fundamental personality is funny joke telling guy, right? Um, anyway, um, David, I, that's I, I agree. Um, it's it's also important that Mike is subject to boredom. David says, um, yes. Yes, agreed. Um, that too, I think, is um, I would I would be willing to add that to his response to humor as one of the sort of f- fundamental things we learn about Mike's personhood and self awareness um, prior to his interactions, which show him attempting to bridge the gap to humanity. Which again, I don't think is necessarily who he is, right? It's how he is connecting with them. Um, so I guess you could say that his, um, his desire to connect, right, um, is also perhaps a third data point. Um, but I think it's maybe related to or even derived from that uh, constructive reaction that I was describing before or attempting to. Okay. Anyway. All right. Lots of stuff here. Man, when this is over, are you going to have time to take up with me that research into humor again? I'll take time, Mike. That's a promise. Thanks, man. These days, you and Wyo never have time to, never have time to visit, and Professor wants to talk about things that aren't much fun. I'll be glad when this war is over. Are we going to win, Mike? He chuckled. It's been days since you asked me that. Here's a pinky new projection. Run since invasion started. Hold on tight, man. Our chances are now even. Good bog. So button up and go see the fun, but stay back at least a hundred meters from the gun. That ship may be able to follow back a laser beam with another one. Ranging shortly, 21 minutes. This is, of course, when the command ship is coming right at them. Um, and we see here, you know, many of the things we were just talking about, right? We see his desire to take up that research into humor again. Has he progressed? Has he grown? Has he learned an amazing amount? Yeah, Mike has grown tremendously uh, from the early chapters. But has he changed? No, no. And to him, um, remember Manny's admission that for Mike, revolution was only game in town, right? Um, That's why he was in it. Um, uh, And he's been having fun. And there have been ways in which, you know, we've seen even ways in which Manny went out of his way, especially early on, um, to indulge um, Mike, right? Remember uh, messing with the environmental controls in, in the warden's house, for instance? Just the kind of joke that, uh, uh, that Mike really enjoyed. Um, Jocelyn is noticing the he chuckled line. Yeah, exactly. Um, look how much he's learned, right? Now, he used to chuckle too. Um, but of course his chuckling, remember, was just the blinking of lights, which Manny came to interpret as chuckling. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Um, these days you and Wyo never have time to visit. He's lonely again, right? He's lonely again, like he was at the beginning. I'll be glad when this war is over. Um, yeah. And it's fascinating because there is a sense as the war begins and picks up the terrifying potential of Mike um, becomes more and more clear, right? I mean, you remember the extent to which Manny said he trusted Mike, right? I mean, no question. Um, he did not, but he absolutely believed in Mike's friendship and loyalty. 
And so he had no problem trusting. You know, their entire revolution relied upon trusting Mike absolutely and utilizing his abilities, um, putting themselves into Mike's power. Um, Mike always could have destroyed them at any time he wanted to, and he obviously still could, right? I mean, he could destroy, he could kill every loony in Luna if he wanted to, right? Um, the When we see him taking over, making all these independent decisions, doing things in Manny's name, um, there is nothing he could not take over. He already controls almost everything. Um, Prof gave us glimpses of this, right? Um, gave us glimpses of this with um, his... Uh, when he said that, you know, our friend Mike is our worst enemy, Right what do you mean? You don't trust, don't, don't trust Mike, right? Was exactly Manny's response. Um, what Prof meant, all Prof meant was the freedom of the press, right? And how Mike controls all of it. You know, all communications are funneled through Mike. And so there is one person, Mike, and through Mike, a small group of people um, who can control all you know, communication in and out, of, of, of Luna, right. Can, can control everything. Um, all messaging, all public information is controlled. That's what he meant. Right. But there could be so much more. And Ellen, that was absolutely my experience. Um, all the way through. I really, I really liked the character of Manny and I really liked the character of Mike. Um, when I first read this book. And I remember Ellen says, I've been spending this whole book concerned that Mike is going to turn. Yes. Um, I was so worried about that when I first read this book. I, I, I very clearly remember that particular emotional response. Um, and I was, I just, I had so much dread and every time we got to these passages when he's taking over and doing everything himself, and I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And um, but I was clinging to these passages. Right. Um, I'll be glad when this war is over. Um, it's. Um, I had this horrible, horrible sinking feeling that everything was going to that this quirky little semi-utopia that Heinlein was writing was going to turn dystopian uh, at the end. So it would have been so easy to do, right? Um, it would have been absolutely. It's, I mean, it seems almost inevitable, doesn't it? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I agree, Jocelyn. I think that Heinlein does take a lot of effort to make us uh, to make us love Mike, to endear Mike to us. I agree. I agree. Which is why. And this was the first Heinlein book I ever read, Jocelyn. Um, and so I was. I didn't know if I could trust Heinlein. Um, I thought it might have been. I was braced, bracing myself for an elaborate sell, right. Um, to have the rug pulled out from under me at the end of the book when Mike takes over and, like, decides it would be more fun to, like, destroy the whole lunar colony and hand things over to authority or whatever. Um, yes, exactly. Several of you have uh, clearly have um, Hal the computer in the back of your minds, right, as you uh, um, are approaching this. It was a hard, uh, hard thing to avoid. Hang on a second. Arthur, you told me this before. Which came? This came first. Right. This was pre Hal, wasn't it? So he didn't even uh, Heinlein didn't have that as a, as an exit. Did he? This was pre Hal. Yes. By two years. It was very close. OK, um, so Hein. So Mike came first before Hal. Um, so um, there is. Um, there's no influence there. So the original audience would not have had to resist that. um I can't do that, Dave, um, voice in the back of their head, right? That um, they're kind of always expecting Mike to suddenly speak in. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> I couldn't help it. Um, and what's more, it just, it seemed like a very, I, I, even if, even, even without that, right? Even without any influence from, you know, Hal towards Mike, I, um, 
I st- it still seemed like one very, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going through, right? And I'm like uh, calculating the odds that <laughs> Mike doesn't turn. <laughs> and I, I'm getting to these sections and I'm like, oh man, I put the odds at like, you know, 100 to 1 against. Um, yeah, Stephen agreed. Absolute power corrupts absolutely is an even older trope. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, they're deciding, Manny and Mike, alone, together, because why I was... Uh, she was in the hospital and now, she, you know, in the hospital is helping people and now she's asleep. Um, uh, prof has not been heard of. Um, poor Adam Celine is dead. They've killed him off. Um, so here's Mike and Manny having to make the decision whether they um, uh, give the order, right? Start the retaliation. I say not to wait. Man, I've used your voice freely and made all preparations. Horror pictures, Old Dome and elsewhere, especially Churchill Upper, for video. Stories to match. We should channel news Earthside at once and announce execution of Hard Rock at the same time. I just noticed something. Doesn't Mike usually use definite articles? Yes, he does. Announce execution of Hard Rock at same time. Um... I think that's Mike talking like Manny, isn't it? Um, anyway, uh, I took a deep breath. Execute Operation Hard Rock. Want to give the order yourself? Say it aloud, and I'll match it. Voice and choice of words. Go ahead. Say it your way. Use my voice and my authority as Minister of Defense and Acting Head of Government. Do it, Mike. Throw rocks at him. Damn it, big rocks. Hit him hard. Right-o, man. In the end, Mike does defer to Manny. Let He does not say, I was all ready for him to say, that's okay, Manny. I've already executed the order. The rocks are already headed towards Earth, right? Which Manny would have been fine with, right? Would have been totally fine with it. Just as he was totally fine with what Mike did before. I don't see Manny reacting negatively to Mike using his voice and talking to Greg and everything else, right? Um, but he doesn't. He does defer to Manny here, right? Almost like back in the old days when, um, remember when he had to be told um, he could, he had been programmed not to break into these files, but if he were verbally instructed to do so by Manny, which was like a another programming, right? Then he could do it when he was looking into the warden's files. Remember that? Um, uh, it's almost, it's, it's, it, it, it's reminiscent of that, but it's clearly not the same thing. He, there's no inhibition that prevents it, right? Um, he waits, he defers to Manny and Manny is the one who gives the order to Mike. He says it, execute operation hard rock. But then he defers to Mike. Want to, want to give the order yourself? And then he says, no, 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 you just say it in my voice, whatever. It's fine. Use my voice and my authority. Uh, um, say it your way. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, oh, sorry. The missing word, Arthur. I'm saying I'm at same time is where I was seeing it. Um, announce uh, 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 execution of hard rock at same time, which is just how Manny would say it without the definite article at the same time. Um, but Mike had usually used definite article. Sorry, the, I, sorry, I wasn't more explicit about the the phrase I was uh, I was talking about there. Um, to me, there's a, a a fun kind of reciprocity here, right? Um, one of the things I take from this passage is that, um, and this is where Ellen. This is where I began to breathe. Uh, like, I started to recalculate the odds in my head at this point, right? From here, I gave, uh, I, 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 I made a pinky new prediction and gave even odds that Mike was not going to turn. Um, there's a beautiful kind of reciprocity here, 
reciprocity, mutual respect, working together, right? This is one of the most lovely examples of the human and the computer working together, you know, with mutual trust and respect, um, uh, both understanding the strengths and weaknesses of each other. Um, I, uh, uh, absolutely. Though, David, I do agree with you. right oh man is not exactly uh, the, like the, um, uh, yeah, it's not, ex- I'm not a hundred percent. It's not a completely tone deaf response, but it, it's not, as you say, um, quite appropriate to the gravity of the situation. Um, some of it, some of the emotional weight of the situation is still going over his head a little bit. Um, right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, though Arthur, that's with, um, all due willingness to be corrected. (laughs) Perhaps, perhaps, we are merely misperceiving that because we didn't live in the sixties. I don't know. You can tell us whether you think, uh, whether you think there is, uh, we're right in hearing that disjunction there. Um, uh, I can't, you know, I can't, uh, I can't be a hundred percent sure of that. Um, okay. Um, Okay, I wanted to start with the bombing, but um, I'm not going to uh, start the bombing because it's late. It's just about time. 1158 is not the time (laughs) to begin uh, a new chapter and the chapter of the bombardment of Earth. Um, So let us save that. We shall do the bombardment of Earth and the resolution of the story next time. uh, was really glad we got to the things that we got to tonight. We didn't get as far as I'd wanted to get, but we actually got through a lot of the content I was hoping to talk about. Uh, so that was really good. We will still finish next week, Arthur. That's going to happen. Um, that's going to happen. Um, so, um, so yeah, we will, um, um, we'll, we'll start here. We'll start here next time. Um, it's not important. Just warn you in advance. It is not impossible. Um, Some of you will have remembered other occasions on which I was bound and determined uh, to um, finish (laughs) on the next class and ended up going for three hours uh, for that final session. Um, I make no promises that that will not happen next week. Um, I am determined to finish next week, even if that is what it takes. Um, But I, 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 I doubt it. I, I think it's uh, uh, odds are, you know, um, no more than uh, 10 to 1. That's going to happen. So uh, it, sh- it should be fine. Um, uh, and then just a reminder, I said at the very beginning, uh, but in case you missed it, we're going to start. The, I'm, I'm pushing it back just a little bit to give a little bit more time. And for the fun, symbolic importance, we're going to start discussing the nature of Middle Earth on Bilbo's birthday. 22nd of September. Um, so next week we'll finish the moon is a harsh, the moon is a harsh mistress. Then we'll have one week off and then we will start the nature of middle earth, um, on the 22nd of September, a day of note indeed. Um, all right. Very good. Thank you everybody. Uh, good night. And I will see you guys for the big conclusion next week. Thanks everybody. Bye now.